What are the seven seals? The first installment of the New Testament, the Book of Revelation, tells of a scroll that is secured tightly with seven seals. These seals describe a series of catastrophic events that will mark Christ's second coming and the beginning of the end of days. Described in Revelation chapters 5 through 8, the seven seals prediction is based on a vision that John had of the scroll while he was imprisoned on the island of Patmos. Nobody on earth or in heaven is worthy or capable of opening the scroll, including God's most faithful servants. This upset John deeply and made him cry because it left him wondering if there was anyone out there who could look at the scroll and see the prophecies described in the seals. Revelation goes on to describe how an elder told John to stop weeping and that the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, was capable of breaking the seals and unfurling the document. To most, this is a direct reference to Jesus, although some branches of Christianity consider Jesus and God to be the same entity and refer to the scroll holder as God. As the COVID-19 pandemic gripped the planet in early 2020, biblical scholars announced that the prophecies depicted in the first four seals have been activated. While there's no definitive proof of whether or not this is true, some would argue that they make a good case for it. After watching today's video, you can decide for yourself and let me know what you think. The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse The first four seals are known as the Four Horsemen. They represent disease, war, famine, and death. The horsemen have authority over one quarter of the earth, according to chapter 6 of Revelation. In a 2005 article for The Trumpet, biblical scholar Fred Dottolo wrote that the galloping hoofbeats of the four horses are getting ever louder and closer. He claimed that the only thing that was needed to release the final horseman was a disease that would infect a quarter of the world's population. When the COVID-19 pandemic hit in early 2020, Dottolo's predictions once again made the airwaves, with many believing that the coronavirus symbolized the fulfillment of the fourth seal. As of late 2021, roughly 43% of the world, around 3.8 billion people, had been infected with COVID, according to the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy. This vastly exceeds the one-quarter percentage mentioned in the Bible, but even before the numbers were this high, social media users were speculating that the coronavirus signified that we are entering the end times. If this is the case, then it means that three more seals need to be broken before Christ's second coming occurs. But before we get to that, let's go over the four horsemen in detail. The first seal. Revelation describes the first seal as a white horse from heaven with a man seated on it with a bow, clothed in a blood-stained garment. The verse goes on to say that he was given a crown and proceeded to go out conquering and to complete his conquest. The rider is identified only as the Word of God, rather than by name. Because Jesus acts as God's spokesman, some consider the Word of God to be a title afforded exclusively to him, which means he is the man on the horse. Revelation chapter 19 verse 16 states that there's a name written on the thigh of the horse rider's garment, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This description falls in line with Jesus' position within God's kingdom, further suggesting that he is the rider of the white horse. The scripture clearly speaks of a man who does not abuse his power to rule. In saying that the first horseman begins his ride upon receiving a crown, it points toward a time when Jesus has been crowned King of Heaven. Many Christians disagree on whether this has happened yet and when. Some argue that worsening conditions on earth indicate that Jesus has received his crown and is ruling heaven. To some, the man on the horse represents the Antichrist, and his mission will involve deceptive talks of peace, followed by him waging war on the saints. This belief came along in 1866, after Christians believed steadily for nearly 19 centuries that the White Rider was a positive figure. Others have suggested that the rider symbolizes warfare or disease. The Second Seal the second seal is described as a red, fiery colored horse ridden by someone who's been granted with the power to take peace away from the earth. In the words of Revelation 6, he receives a great sword so that they should slaughter one another. This is generally interpreted to mean that the rider of the red horse represents warfare or the declaration of war. His possession of a large sword indicates that bloodshed will occur, and he's often depicted holding the weapon upward 
which is symbolic of entering battle. For those who believe that the white horse represents a war of conquest, the red horse represents civil war. Others have suggested that the red horse symbolizes the persecution of Christians. Some Christians think that the second seal was broken with the onset of World War I. It was the first global conflict, which seems to align with the Bible's prediction that the rider of the red horse will have the power to take peace away from the earth. Those who believe this theory see World War II, which was much larger and bolder than World War I, as further proof that the seal has been broken. The advent of the nuclear bomb, which has the power to annihilate the globe, is also sometimes cited as evidence, along with the failure of peacekeeping organizations like the United Nations to prevent ongoing destruction between countries. The Third Seal According to the prophecy of the Third Seal, a black horse is ridden by a man with a pair of scales in his hand. At the time the Bible was written, this is how bread would have been weighed for sale, leading to the belief that the rider of the black horse represents famine. According to Revelation chapter 6, verse 6, John heard a voice among the four horses specifying that a quart of wheat or three quarts of barley would come at the cost of one denarius. During biblical times, one denarius was roughly the equivalent of a day's wages, and a quart of wheat probably wouldn't have gone far to feed a large family indicating that food will become both scarce and expensive as the end of days approaches. It's not hard to understand why, as the US and many other countries experience the highest inflation levels in decades, some might believe that the third seal has been broken. Food prices have increased dramatically since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, and it only seems to be getting more expensive just to afford basic nourishment. Interestingly, the Bible verse describing the voice that told John about the prices of wheat and barley instructed him to leave wine and olive oil alone. This suggests that the cost of these items, which were already luxury goods unavailable to many commoners, was to remain unchanged. During a famine, grain crops would have been more vulnerable to damage than olive trees or grapevines, perhaps indicating that their value was less likely to fluctuate with the onset of a drought. On the other hand, the verse could indicate that because oil and wine are used in Christian sacraments, they were to be left alone so that faithful worshippers continue to have access to them. The Fourth Seal The fourth rider is the only one of the four horsemen with a name, and it's pretty straightforward. He's called Death, and he rides either a pale or yellowish-green horse. Some scholars interpret this as the color of a corpse. Unlike the other riders, biblical verses don't describe the fourth horseman carrying anything in his hands, although depictions commonly show him holding a scythe or a sword. He is followed by Hades, the resting place of the dead. While some Christians believe that the rider represents death in a general sense, others believe that the fourth horseman represents pestilence or disease. This is why many became concerned at the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic that the fourth seal had been broken. It's hard to say whether this is true. There have been numerous extremely deadly plagues throughout history, and even in the last century alone. The Spanish flu killed tens of millions, starting around the end of World War I, with as many as one in every three people throughout the world being affected. Throughout the 20th century, smallpox claimed hundreds of millions of lives and diseases that people in first world countries often think of as outdated or treatable still affect millions today, including malaria, tuberculosis, and HIV AIDS. COVID-19 has killed less than six and a half million people, according to estimates. That's a lot of people, and the numbers unfortunately continue to rise, so it's definitely something to be concerned about. Yet it's a mere percentage of the amount of lives that many other illnesses have taken. But it hit hard and fast, and claimed an alarming number of lives in a short time, leaving one to wonder if it is, perhaps, a sign of worse things to come. What do you think? Does the current pandemic represent a concerning turning point toward the end of times? Let me know in the comments below. The Fifth Seal According to the prophecy of the fifth seal, those martyred will ask God how much longer it will be until he judges the earth. God gives each of them a white robe and tells them to rest a little while longer. Some interpretations hold that the Christian martyrs who cried for vindication represent those who were persecuted by the Jews between Jesus' death and the year 70 AD. 
The prediction was written during the harshest and most widespread period of Christian persecution, which was followed by Constantine's rise to power and the legalization of Christianity. This perhaps suggests that the martyrs described in the fifth seal are not limited to those who were persecuted by the Jews, but by other groups and leaders as well, and some see Constantine's decision to allow Christianity as the vindication that the martyrs were seeking. But many, if not most Christians, believe that the fifth seal has yet to be fulfilled. According to this view, those who are loyal to their faith will be martyred for their refusal to bow down to the Antichrist or cave to the global economic system that is often seen as anathema to being a good Christian. The fifth seal encompasses a wide variety of beliefs among the devout, but these different versions have several things in common, including the punishment of Christians for refusing to denounce their faith. It correlates with a trying period known as the Great Tribulation, which is slated to occur when end times are near. While this means different things to worshippers of different branches of Christianity, it has a consistent underlying theme. The Sixth Seal The Sixth Seal predicts that catastrophic natural events will take place as the apocalypse approaches. Chapter 6 of Revelation describes a large earthquake, the sun turning black, the moon becoming like blood, and the stars falling to the earth. It states that the sky will vanish like a scroll that is being rolled up, and that mountains and islands will disappear. According to some early thinkers, the sixth seal came to fruition as early as the year 68 AD, which marked the lead-up to the siege of Jerusalem by Titus that happened two years later. Others believe that the scripture references the fall of Rome, which brought on invasions from the Visigoths and the Vandals from 375 to 418 AD. Many think that the unfolding of the sixth seal is yet to come, and that it will come with massive destruction of some sort, including possibly nuclear warfare or a huge volcanic eruption that causes ash to blanket the sky. The latter has happened before, and the consequences were far-reaching for life on Earth, where the climate was dramatically altered. Some feel that the disasters described in the sixth seal prophecy will primarily affect those who oppose God or persecuted Christians. According to this interpretation, the righteous will be spared from the cataclysmic horror, while the unrighteous will experience its full wrath. Regardless of which version of the sixth seal someone chooses to believe, its events will constitute a major sign that we are approaching the very end of time, and it predicts that an estimated one-third of mankind will be wiped out. The Seventh Seal when the seventh and final seal is broken, heaven will be quiet for half an hour. It's reminiscent of the day of rest, Sunday, that God took on the seventh day after creating the world. The silence is followed by the sounding of trumpets, and the next stage of judgment begins. Those who take a more historical view of the Bible believe that the silence spoken of in the description of the seventh seal represents the 70-year period that followed Constantine's defeat of Linnaeus in the Roman Empire. Others who believe that the seventh seal has yet to be fulfilled think of the silence as the final moments before the guilty are declared guilty. In other words, the unrighteous will be called out and made to answer for their lack of devotion. Christians who have any chance of being martyred will spend this time praying to be spared from doom. Another interpretation of the prophecy that falls along similar lines views the silence as a calm before the storm. The number seven is significant in Christianity, as the opposite of the devil's number 666. While six represents imperfection or incompletion, seven symbolizes goodness and wholesomeness. This is why there are seven days of the week, seven seals, and other predictions based on the number seven, including the seven trumpets, which come immediately after the fulfillment of the seals. The Son of the Devil In Christian mythology, the Antichrist will appear just before the end of times. He's the son of the devil, a truly evil human that is the exact opposite to Jesus Christ. The perfect Jesus was born of a virgin, but the Antichrist will be born of a woman with what we can only call promiscuous tendencies. In the New Testament, there are only a few passages that briefly mention the Antichrist. All of them can be found in the letters of John, and they suggest that the end of the world could happen at any moment. 
For the first few centuries of Christianity, the Antichrist wasn't a very popular figure. It wasn't until scholars of the early church began to look through other religious texts that they started to pick out which characters they thought best fit the description of the Antichrist. For example, the abomination of desolation in the book of Daniel and the son of perdition in a letter of Paul. Slowly but surely, the myth of the Antichrist was born. The earliest true depiction of this evil human didn't really target just one person in particular. Christians believed the Antichrist would be either one person or a group of people who would oppose Jesus Christ at the end of times. It was thought that they would try to substitute themselves in his place just before the world ended. The Antichrist would act as a false prophet who will announce himself as Christ and perform great wonders to captivate the people of the world. Those who can't see through the guise of this trickster will be sent to damnation when Christ comes to usurp him and take his place as Lord of the world. These days, the son of perdition has taken on a new personality of his own. However, through the years, the man of legend has been compared to a lot of different figures and groups. Early Christians even believed that all of Rome was the Antichrist, as well as multiple emperors, the Jewish people, and every popular figure in modern times from Hitler to multiple US presidents. The Roman Antichrist in the book of Revelation, the last chapter of the Christian Bible, there is a passage which says, No one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or name of the beast, or the number of his name, and his number is 666. For 2,000 years, this one excerpt from the book has been the subject of extreme debate. Who is the beast? What does the beast sell? And what is 666? Most biblical scholars agree the beast is the Antichrist. Most biblical scholars also agree that Saint John, the one describing the events at the end of the world, was referring to the Roman Empire. Depending on who you ask, this is because the Bible isn't a book of scripture, but a storybook designed to create anti-Roman sentiment amongst the Jewish people. In 66 AD, John himself the author of the book of Revelation had almost certainly seen the destruction of Jerusalem at the hands of the Romans. The city was destroyed, the people were slaughtered, and Rome really did resemble the Antichrist to the Judeans. Rome was an agent of evil, a destroyer of worlds, and in direct opposition with the Judean god. The emperor in power at the time Jerusalem was destroyed was Nero, who reigned between 37 and 68 AD. He was considered the worst of the worst, and the Judeans absolutely hated him. After he died in the year 68, his body was supposedly never found. Legend began to spread amongst the people that he would later return as the Antichrist, and so scholars believe that when John wrote the book of Revelation, the son of perdition he described was in fact Emperor Nero. Adso of Montier en Der. Adso of Montier en Der was the male leader of the Benedictine monastery in France. He died in the year 999 AD while on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. He's not very well known these days, but he was kind of a big deal a thousand years ago. He was a leading scholar in the world of Christianity and wrote five important works during his life. His most famous is a biography of the Antichrist. It was this seemingly innocent Benedictine abbot who wrote everything we now know about the son of perdition today. In this book, he painted a vivid picture of the son of the devil, and it became the basis for all the myths and legends that would later come about. The truly fascinating thing about the biography of the Antichrist is that it wasn't based on any kind of real religious scripture. He supposedly combined ancient Greek lore from the oracles of long-dead prophetesses and what little is mentioned of the Antichrist in the Bible. In doing this, he created a kind of made-up history book on the career and life of the son of perdition, and back then it would have flown off the shelves. These days, people read biographies about ex-presidents and rock stars. A thousand years ago, people read biographies about saints, monks, nuns, and characters from Christian mythology that may or may not have even existed. Adso claimed that when the last world emperor united all the Christians and the Muslims were defeated once and for all, the Antichrist would be born. The evil human would be a Jewish person born in Babylon 
and he would apparently be brought up by wizards. Nostradamus and the Antichrist Nostradamus was a famous French philosopher, mathematician, astrologer, and seer of the future. He may have died in 1566 AD, but his predictions are still going strong. His book Les Prophéties was published in 1555 AD and contained heaps of vague and ambiguous predictions for what would happen in the future. Some say he predicted the terrifying attack on 9-11, the rise of Donald Trump, and there are people who even believe he prophesied the coming of the Antichrist. One of the biggest issues with the prophecies of Nostradamus is that None of them are very specific. His predictions are kind of like astrological fortunes in the backs of newspapers. The wording is vague yet specific enough that it could easily apply to any situation after a hefty amount of mental gymnastics. That being said, there is one event that Nostradamus predicted with extreme clarity. He calls it the final conflagration and he says it will happen in about 1,770 years. Nostradamus wrote that the earth will tremble, fire will come from the heavens, and the world will be destroyed. He also claimed that three antichrists would come in the modern age to bring great death and destruction. The first of these sons of perdition was Napoleon Bonaparte, the ruthless French ruler who cast war across the world, followed by Adolf Hitler, the dastard behind the atrocities of World War II. However, the third Antichrist has yet to reveal themselves. Nostradamus expert Bobby Shaler believes the third evil human is coming, most likely in the next 10 to 20 years. Do you believe this? Tell us why or why not in the comments below, and hit subscribe while you're at it. Martin Luther and the Protestant Reformation Martin Luther attended college in the 16th century and then went on to law school, but found himself so fascinated with the word of God that he became a monk. He always feared the Creator's wrath, and so he entered Augustine's monastery in July of 1505 AD in order to prove his devotion. He even reportedly confessed his sins every single day. Martin Luther was so dedicated to the church that he delved deep into biblical studies. He would go on to become a professor of theology at the University of Wittenberg and later became a harsh critic of the Roman Catholic Church. Martin Luther was responsible for beginning the Protestant Reformation on October 31, 1517 AD. He published a document called the 95 Theses which was a series of ideas about Christianity that were in direct contradiction of the Catholic Church. The issue at the time was that the Catholic Church was involved in a lot of trickery and thievery. For example, the Church was teaching people that the only way they could get into heaven was if they had enough merits. The only way to earn merits was through prayer, worship, trips to Rome to visit relics, and donations to the Church. Essentially, if you didn't give enough money to the church, they wouldn't let your soul into heaven, and you would be damned to hell. Martin Luther knew this was wrong, and so he started the Protestant movement. The Protestants believed that the relationship between people and God should be personal, not relying on the church or on corrupt bishops who practiced extortion openly. This distrust of the church and the knowledge that the Roman Catholic leaders were a corrupt body of politicians and thieves would lead to great struggles in Europe. It would also lead to the widespread theory that the Antichrist is the Church itself, the Pope as the Antichrist. If the Church itself isn't the Antichrist, the Pope might be. In the days of Martin Luther before he died in 1546 AD, rumor had spread that Pope Leo X was the spawn of Satan himself. Pope John Paul II in the 1970s and Pope Benedict XVI in 2005 were both popular contestants for the role of Antichrist. Just about every pope has been rumored at least once to be the person who will usher in the end of times. Part of this comes from the book of Revelation. There's a passage which says, The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. Since Rome used to be called the city on seven hills, it's commonly believed that the Antichrist will rise out of Rome. And since the Roman Catholic Church is often viewed as the epicenter of corruption in all of Rome, it makes sense that the Pope would be the devil before the apocalypse. Rasputin 
Grigory Efimovich Rasputin, commonly known as just Rasputin, was born a peasant in the year 1869. He became a friend of Nicholas II, who was the last emperor of Russia, and as a result he gained an impossible amount of influence. Rasputin was never really popular with anyone. He wiggled himself into high society, began acting as a healer for the emperor and empress in 1906, and was viewed by everyone outside the immediate royal family as a mystic and a no-good liar. He was a charlatan, and when Nicholas II left Russia in 1915 to fight in World War I, Rasputin was left alone with Empress Alexandra. His influence soared, and he became such a dark and bizarre figure that he was assassinated in 1916. However, Rasputin's creepiness stems back to when he was just a young man. He was what they called a stranik, a holy wanderer, and he had a small group of disciples who followed him around. He created a church and practiced religious blasphemy by preaching the need for sin. He and his followers practiced strange rituals and participated in group intercourse, in the name of God, of course. It's not hard to see how he became viewed as a false prophet. He claimed to be a man of God, but was very clearly disturbed. In June of 1914, a peasant woman tried to assassinate Rasputin by stabbing him in the stomach. He was wounded but survived, and the woman claimed she did it because he was the Antichrist, a sentiment shared by many. Armalus In Jewish mythology, Armalus is the anti-messiah. He is described as the one who will conquer the earth, destroy Jerusalem, slaughter the Jewish people, and eventually be defeated by the Jewish messiah. His story can be found in the Sefer Zerubbabel, also known as the Apocalypse of Zerubbabel. It's an old Hebrew prophecy of the end of times written in the 7th century. Much like the story in the book of Genesis, the Apocalypse of Zerubbabel details the events before the world comes to an end. Armalus is the Jewish version of the Antichrist, described as a king who rises up against the Messiah. However, just like the story of Jesus and Satan, he's destroyed in the final battle between good and evil. Oddly enough, Armalus is said to be a product of Satan and a virgin. That way he can trick the masses into believing that he's the true Messiah. The Islamic Antichrist The Islamic faith has their very own Antichrist as well, and his name is Al-Dajjal. He's also known as the Deceiver, and he's a false messiah who comes just before the end of days. However, unlike the Antichrist of Jewish and Christian myth, he has a very specific time frame for his coming. The Islamic faith believes that he will rise up for approximately 40 days or 40 years. They never could decide on which one it was. He's then going to be destroyed by Christ, or the rightly guided one, as they call him, and the world will then bend to God's will. Unlike many other religions, the Prophet Muhammad gives us a really clear vision of what the Islamic Antichrist looks like. He's apparently described as a plump man with one eye, an ugly face, curly hair, and the Arabic word for unbelief stamped on his forehead. If this man is the true al-Dajjal, he won't be hard to identify. The Many Antichrists of the Old Testament In the Old Testament, there are four verses in the letters of 1 and 2 John which discuss the true identity of the Antichrist. These are some of the oldest and most authentic Christian descriptions there are, as they are in the Bible and weren't part of any non-canonical scripts written afterward. What's really interesting is that in the verses of the New Testament, the Antichrist is nowhere described as being a single person. Instead, the spawn of Satan is a group of false teachers who will deny the teachings of Christ. Even more frightening, in 2 John chapter 1 verse 7 it says, Many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is the deceiver and the Antichrist. What this means is that anyone who doesn't accept Jesus is themselves one of the sons of perdition. If the New Testament is to be taken at its word, the hard truth is that there is no mighty son of Satan who will appear before the end of times. It's only later in the New Testament and the book of Revelation that multiple figures are described as possible antichrists. The Lake of Fire One of the scariest places in the entire book of Revelation 
is the lake of fire. The Bible refers to the lake of fire as the second death, the ultimate consequence of a person's sin, and a place devoid of God's eternal love. Most religious scholars agree the lake of fire is the biblical version of hell, but the truth is that nowhere in the Old Testament is there the briefest mention of such a place. It's simply not a concept that's in the Bible. The word hell originally comes from a rough translation of Hades, the Greek underworld in classical mythology. However, in the Bible, there's no firm description of a place called hell, where evil people go to be burned by Satan for all eternity. Instead, the closest we get is the lake of fire. It's used in approximately five verses in the book of Revelation, described as a place of burning and brimstone. The beasts at the end of days and the false prophet will be cast into the lake of fire, and so too will the devil that deceives the world with the mark of the beast. Revelation says the cowardly, faithless, detestable, immoral, idolaters, liars, and murderers will be sent to the lake of fire. Interestingly, there have been a lot of interpretations throughout the years of what the lake of fire could really be. The Jehovah's Witnesses believe the lake of fire is a total annihilation of the human soul, but in ancient Egyptian mythology, it's just an obstacle that a person must journey through in the underworld, which can either refresh or destroy the deceased. The Woman Child Dragon There is a very strange scene in Revelation 12 which speaks of two great signs seen in heaven. The first is a pregnant woman in labor, who's clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, wearing a crown of twelve stars. The second sign in heaven is a great red dragon with seven heads, ten horns, and seven crowns upon its head. The dragon sweeps a third of the stars from the sky to the earth with its tail, then it stands before the pregnant woman, ready to devour her child the very second it's born. However, after the woman gives birth, her baby is snatched away to God and to his throne, and protected. The woman then flees from the dragon into the wilderness, where God has prepared a special place for her to go. It's arguably one of the most confusing pieces of revelation, and biblical scholars have never been able to agree on what John was describing in this vision. Who was the woman clothed in the sun and the moon? Why was her baby so special? And what did the dragon want with it? Biblical expert Adela Yarbrough Collins believes it may have had something to do with John's own banishment in the time he was writing the book of Revelation. John lived 2,000 years ago, when the Romans had banned prophecy, astrology, and magic. The dragon was likely meant to be a representation of Rome, and John might have chosen the woman as a metaphor for himself. He was banished to the island of Patmos, just like the woman retreating into the woods, the beast from the sea. Chapter 13 in the book of Revelation contains mention of a creature that's been the subject of great controversy throughout the centuries. As John stands at the seashore, he witnesses a beast rise out of the sea with seven heads and ten horns, and upon each horn is a crown. Multiple heads and crowns was a fairly common theme in the Bible, but this beast was a little different than the others. It looked like a leopard, but it had the feet of a bear, the mouth of a lion, and was imbued with great power by the dragon. In the Bible, the dragon is mentioned everywhere and is typically believed to be either a representation of the Roman Empire or Satan himself. The beast which rises from the sea is seen as a thing of great evil. It becomes a figure of powerful authority and a terrible creature that will be followed by many. The beast from the sea also wears the mark of the beast, and its number is 666. But why is this terrible beast given the number of 666? Again, with many of the horrors of Revelation, we get various interpretations by different religious sects. Some believe 666 is meant to identify the major shortcomings of humanity, since the number 7 in ancient times was seen as the perfect number. 6 was just shy of perfect, and 3 of them suggested incompetence on a gross scale. Another theory is that 666 comes from Roman Emperor Nero. If you take the letters in his official name, Caesar Nero, and assign them to Hebrew numbers, and add them together, you get 666. So, it could be that the beast was a metaphor for Emperor Nero, the plagues of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, those who have no faith in God and worship false idols are sent seven plagues at the end of days. John of Patmos, the author of Revelation, sees God hand a scroll closed by seven seals to the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, in a vision. As the Lamb of God opens the scrolls, by cracking each seal one at a time, he releases upon the world unimaginable horrors. 
The first four seals release the four horsemen of the apocalypse, death, pestilence, famine, and war. The fifth, sixth, and seventh seals all unleash great calamities. The fifth seal releases the cries of the martyrs, and the wrath of God comes down on the unholy. The sixth seal brings the stars falling from the sky, and the seventh and final seal signals the seven angelic trumpeters to unleash their seven plagues. Things just get more catastrophic as each seal is broken. The plagues come when the angels begin blowing their trumpets, and just like with the seven seals, the angels release the plagues one at a time. The first plague is painful sores that will befall everyone who bears the mark of the beast. The second is a plague of blood, turning the sea into human blood so that all living creatures in it die. The third plague turns the rivers to blood as well. The fourth is one of heat, causing all those with the mark of the beast to be scorched by the sun in agony. The fifth is a plague of darkness, covering the world in shadow. The sixth is violence, as the false prophet gathers the nations of the world to the battle of Armageddon. And finally, the seventh plague is one of death. Thunder and lightning come from the sky, all the cities of the world are destroyed, and everyone left standing is dead. The Bottomless Pit The Bottomless Pit is mentioned in the Book of Revelation as a terrifying place similar to the Lake of Fire. It's not mentioned as frequently, but was still a place of eternal evil. The Bottomless Pit, also called the Abyss, is the home of a horrible demon in Revelation who unleashes a plague of locusts on the world following the second coming of Christ. The bottomless pit is also the place where Satan is bound and imprisoned for a thousand years before being unleashed on the world. Biblical scholars believe the bottomless pit may have been inspired by Tartarus. In Greek mythology, Tartarus is the place where evil criminals, monsters of men, and real monsters were imprisoned within Hades. And there's a passage in the book of Peter describing the bottomless pit as a place where sinful angels are placed in chains in darkness to await their judgment. It's shout out time. Big thank you to Kay Winter and Andrew McGuire for watching and supporting this channel. If you're new to Origins Explained, be sure to subscribe and join the family. The Fall of Babylon Babylon is a big player throughout both the Old Testament and the New Testament. This is because King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon was not a very nice person to the Israelites. Historically speaking, the Babylonians invaded Jerusalem, destroyed the temple to their god, and took many of them as slaves. The people of Jerusalem, descendants of the kingdom of Judah, were bullied by the Babylonians, the Romans, and the rest of their neighbors as well. This is why most biblical scholars believe the villains in the Bible are representations of antagonistic kingdoms. In Revelation 18, an angel comes down from heaven and cries out that Babylon has fallen. God destroys the city because it becomes a home for demons, unclean men, and despicable beasts. But remember, Revelation is a prophecy of the end of days, and Babylon is already long gone. So what could possibly be the Babylon that will fall during the apocalypse? That's a question nobody has the answer to. Some people believe the United States of America could be the new Babylon, and that when the nation becomes too obsessed with luxury and wealth and strays too far from God, they will be destroyed, releasing Satan from his prison. Revelation 20 explains that after the devil is imprisoned for a thousand years, he will finally be released to deceive the nations of the earth and gather them for battle against Christ. It's an extremely vague passage that doesn't seem to make much sense, but has terrifying implications. It seems to say that after a thousand years of Christ ruling the earth, God will allow Satan to spring forth from the bottomless pit or the dark of the abyss to gather the forces of evil. But why would God do such a thing when he could easily banish Satan forever? instead. One theory is that God wants to use the devil to bring out all the non-believers from hiding. After the tribulation, when plagues and violence are unleashed upon those wearing the mark of the beast, some will change their evil ways. These individuals will seek Christ, and they will still be alive when the tribulations are over. However, some believe that releasing the devil from his prison is a final trick. It's a way to see which unbelievers will revert back to evil and follow Satan. This way, God can toss them into the lake of fire forever and exclude them from the world after the apocalypse. The Four Horsemen When the Lamb of God first begins to open the seven seals, he releases the four horsemen of the apocalypse. The most widely agreed interpretation of the four horsemen is that they are a force which comes to decimate the human population through war, disease, and hunger. The White Horseman of the Apocalypse is the first to be released, and in Revelation chapter 6, it says he goes forth conquering. 
This rider is believed to be a personification of disease and pestilence. To conquer in this case means to take over with disease, bringing death to everyone he infects. Next rides the Red Horseman of the Apocalypse, who wields a fiery sword and brings death through strife and warfare. This will supposedly be a time in human history when men are crazed with bloodlust and the entire globe is plunged into war and chaos. Then comes the Black Horseman of the Apocalypse, the personification of famine. Disease and war were not enough to kill most of the population, and so famine comes next to destroy crops and bring starvation. The Fourth Horseman rides a pale steed and is meant to represent death itself. He is the only horseman without a weapon, since he's a weapon himself. However, death doesn't go about killing. Instead, the rider comes with hell following behind him, called Hades in the Bible. And as death rides across the world, the mouth of Hades is opened to swallow the souls of the damned. Babylon the Great In the Book of Revelation, Babylon the Great is a female figure of tremendous evil. She is described as the mother of all harlots and every abomination of the earth. It's said that those that inhabit the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. When John is given a vision of this woman, an angel takes him into the wilderness where he finds Babylon the Great sitting upon a scarlet beast. Revelation states states that the beast has seven heads and ten horns, and upon its back is Babylon the Great, drunk on the blood of the martyrs and the blood of saints. This woman is without a doubt one of the most terrifying figures in the entirety of the apocalypse. The chapter continues by saying Babylon the Great sits upon a sea of people, multitudes, nations, and tongues. The angel tells John the woman he sees is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. In other words, Babylon the Great is not some evil woman who will be involved in the apocalypse. Instead, she is the personification of Babylon itself, the city which spawned harlots, sinners, beasts, and cruel men with no faith in God. New Earth At the end of the book of Revelation, when all those who were wicked have been cast out, something magical happens. However, it's only after the dragon is defeated and all his worshippers have been thrown into the lake of fire. With the false prophet gone, all the evil taken out of the world and only the believers left alive, new earth is born. This may seem like paradise, but for some, the idea is utterly terrifying. At the end of days, anyone who was not a devout believer in Jesus Christ will be obliterated and their souls will be gone. It will be as though they never existed at all. As for the original Earth, it will be consumed in a great fire and burned to ashes. The whole world will be replaced by an entirely new planet occupied only by those who believe in Jesus Christ. According to Revelation chapter 1, New Earth is a place of abundance. It will be free from all sin, there will be no sickness or suffering, and nobody will die. The Earth will be as God originally intended, implying he made a major mistake when he created the first world. And while a life without death and sin may sound nice, some think that it's the most terrifying part of the Book of Revelation. What is the scariest part of the Book of Revelation to you? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below, and don't forget to subscribe! Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Bye!